Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, June 9th. Today our special guest is Kim Strobel and her topic is Science of Happiness and its Impact on School Culture. Your co-moderators are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. I'm going to turn the mic over to Susie Higley who will now introduce Kim and ask her the newbie question. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited that we get to learn from Kim today. I have to tell you, the first time I heard about Kim, I was at an association meeting. We were talking about great keynote speakers, and someone said Kim Strobel. I thought, well, now who's Kim Strobel? So I started looking up things about her, and then I watched Matt Miller's uh, Ditch Summit video recordings over Christmas break and Kim was one of them and I thought oh this is fabulous we have to get her for classroom 2.0 and then I even learned she's from Indiana so she, I know she's speaking across the state one of these times we will meet in person so Kim has a wealth of experience and you will just from hearing from her you will, she exudes positivity she has been a classroom teacher a curriculum director a literacy coordinator and she is now a well-known speaker she's the owner of Strobel Education she has wisdom, positivity, and strength that informs every aspect of what she does. She gives workshops, she presents to teachers, and what is so meaningful is she has been a teacher. She's been where we are, and she has done the research, so she has all kinds of things that will help us understand our culture of our school and how happiness is a part of that. So we'll, we'll go now to the newbie question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Kim. So our newbie question, is happiness and school culture connected, and is that related to having a growth mindset? So go ahead and take it away, Kim. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to join you here from Southern Indiana, and yes, I'm a fellow Hoosier, Susie, so um, looking forward to that meeting in person someday. Um, this, I have to tell you, is my absolute favorite topic to uh, discuss, although I feel like I'm just passionate and excited about everything, including life, so people tell me I say this about every topic, but um, happiness is just kind of one of those key topics right now that not just educators, but really everyone is kind of entering this age where happiness and well-being and a sense of fulfillment and meaning are so important uh, to our lives. And so when we think about that in education and the influence that it has uh, to that as well as to this growth mindset philosophy, you know, we do a lot with growth mindset, which is really truly to me based on Carol Dweck's uh, quote that she says, the view that you adopt for yourself uh, profoundly affects the way you lead your life. And so, you know, the view you adopt for yourself, that's your belief system. That's how you navigate the world and what you expect from yourself and from others. And so what we know is that that truly has a profound effect on our everyday decisions and, you know, are we embracing life, are we flourishing in life, or are we uh, merely existing? And so, yeah, I, I really feel like these three key topics are very, very connected to one another. And uh, I'm ready to dive in. So let's go here to the next slide, the science of happiness and its impact on school culture. Um, and it's interesting. I, I have a son who is 17. And so over the years, I have always been a curious bird, and I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of his friends and fellow students, and I always ask them two questions. The one is, who was your favorite teacher? But to me, it's the second question, actually, that I ask them that's the most important, and it's the why. Why is that person your favorite teacher? And 
after interviewing hundreds and hundreds of students, I get the exact same version of the same two answers. And that is, one, I can tell my teacher cares about me. I can tell that they really, truly care about me in the classroom. And the second question, or the second answer, is always, my teacher is happy. My teacher is happy to be there. My teacher loves what they're doing. And it's just been interesting to me that our students, they do, they pick up on kind of the energy and the enthusiasm and the meaning behind why we're there in those classrooms every single day, 180 days a year. And so, you know, I think that this is a topic that we have to consider and that we have to make sure that we kind of find our way back to our own uh, happy. And yes, I, I totally agree, Peggy. Teachers do, or uh, students really do know uh, when their teachers are happy to be there. So we ask this, why happiness in education? Well, I don't think I have to tell you all that as educators, we are extremely stressed, extremely overwhelmed. We are exhausted. Uh, you know, there's, we deal with a lot of trauma just within our classrooms sometimes and the students that we serve. And I was just recently reading about how teachers actually experience secondary trauma. And I believe that to be true. I believe that this profession is one of the most sacred and, and noble professions out there, but it's also one of the hardest, and it's, it's really taking its toll on teachers. Um, they are losing their personal lives at times over this. And it's interesting, I have visited my own general practitioner, doctor, a couple of years ago, and he was telling me, he said, Kim, the number one reason I see patience is for the common cold. And the number two reason I see them is to prescribe an antidepressant. And my number one customer to prescribe antidepressants to are my are teachers. And you know, I that really hit home with me because of course I, I know several teachers who are just feeling like it's too much for them, and they're really struggling to make it through their careers. And so, you know, you combine that with, yeah, what we just saw here in the chat box from Trish, the idea of suicide rates climbing, and, and really we haven't had a strong focus on emotional well-being, both in the classroom for our students as well as our own emotional well-being. And so it's interesting, as I have given professional development uh, throughout the country, um, I might be talking about topics like standards-based grading or growth mindset or genius hour or reader's workshop, writer's workshop, but I sprinkle a lot of my professional development trainings with happiness tips. And when I tell the teachers I'm a happiness coach, that is the very first thing they're interested in. I always laugh that they start to form a line at my uh, table and they want to know when's the happiness retreat and how can they learn about happiness. And so uh, that was definitely a really strong kind of message to me that, hey Kim, uh, you've got to do this well-being piece for teachers. So let's dig into the happiness research, uh, which again, that's a topic that I've studied for over 15 years. And, and there's a, a, a backstory to why and how I became a happiness coach, and we don't have time for that today. But uh, to say the least, I've known darkness, uh, I've known great fear, and I've also learned how to walk through it. And I've been able to walk through it uh, because of the happiness research and some other things that I've done for myself over the years. But when you look at what makes a happiness level or how comes that certain people seem to kind of go through life joyful and inspired and positive, and others have a struggle and have to work at it. And so I want you to think of happiness as a baseline level. And all of us have a level that we're operating from. 
So yours might be a little bit higher. Uh, someone else's might be a little bit lower. And so what happens is something good happens in our life, like we get a new job or we buy a new home or a new car or we go shopping and we get a new purse. And our happiness level will rise for a short period. But it will always go back to the baseline level. Interestingly enough, it's the same thing for when we experience challenges or stress or even trauma. Believe it or not, the science comes back over and over again that you can experience really terrible things in your life. But after a period of about 18 months, your baseline level will reset itself to where it was previously. So when we're looking at where that baseline level comes from, I want you to consider genetics. Because I'm not going to lie to you, 50% of your happiness is genetic. 50% comes from your mom or your dad or a mixture of both. And I always kind of giggle when I tell this to people because I see lots of teachers' heads drop like, oh, there's no chance for me, you know. Uh, but that's only 50% of it. But it makes sense to me, folks, because when we look, you know, even with the people that we work with and we just see these people who are dealing with the same challenges that we are and they, they just seem to navigate it better. They just seem to let it kind of roll off their shoulders. Uh, they're always able to kind of, you know, retrain their lens towards positive. And then there's others who it's a struggle. You know, they uh, might be kind of negative Nellies or their brain might be focused on all that's wrong. And so that's a genetic tendency, but there is something we can do about it. And so there's hope. So hang in here with me for just a moment. So if 50% is genetic, what's really astounding to me is that only 10% of our long-term happiness is based on our external circumstances, folks. This can be anything from a childhood experience to an incident that happened to you to being married, single, divorced, losing a spouse, chronic disease. All of these things are considered external circumstances. And they only account most of the time for about 10% of your long-term happiness. The issue is that we allow, we really do allow those external circumstances to take up more than 10%. And I'm just as guilty as anyone else when it comes to this. I'm kind of giggling to myself right now because I think back to uh, this past winter when my son's basketball team lost sectional, and I'm pretty sure that I let that external circumstance uh, eat up about 90% of my happiness for a good week. So it's interesting that this is what the research says, and so this tells me that we have more control and power over this than what we thought. All right, so now I've kind of laid the seeds here. So if you're looking at a pie chart, you've got 50% genetics, 10% your external circumstance. I'm going to switch to the next slide, and this is the slide that excites me the most. Oops, sorry, let me skip one more. I want to get straight to this one here. 40% is left of that pie chart, and every single one of us, regardless of our genetics, regardless of where our baseline has previously been, regardless of the external circumstances in our life, every single human being has the ability to increase their happiness level by up to 40%, 40%. And this is a practice that I put into my life about 10 years ago. And I, I'm not saying I go around and I'm sugars and sprinkles all of the time. But I will tell you all that almost every day I wake up and I am excited to live my life. And I believe that the happiness habits that I've incorporated for the last 10 years from the happiness research have been a really big part of that. So that's what we teach people in our happiness workshops and retreats. We teach people how do you increase that baseline by up to 
And it's been interesting to me because I feel a sense of renewed hope. I know one of the number one keynotes that I'm getting right now across the country is the one on the science of happiness. And I really appreciate that administrators are understanding that, hey, we've got to take care of our teachers. They need this well-being piece. They need to be able to get their life back. Yes, they need to show up every day and do the best job they can for our students, but they also have to have their personal well-being in check as well. So this, this gives me hope for the education profession, and it gives me hope for people. So again, we're just kind of looking at it in that pie chart. I like a visual. I like to be able to really see here that 50% is genetics, 10% is your circumstances, most of the time. And I say most of the time because, you know, there are these medical conditions. There's depression and anxiety and different things uh, that can really take up more than that 10%. There are some major, um, you know, diseases and disorder that sometimes can kind of mess with that 10%. But the 40%, most of the time, the 40% is absolutely uh, within our control. All right. And so, Peggy, do I just kind of keep talking here and keep jumping from slide to slide? I guess I, I'm not used to not hearing from other people, but I'm just going to keep going until you tell me different. All right. Now, when we're looking here at this chart from Sean Aker, who's one of my favorite people to follow when it comes to positive psychology, um, when we're looking at that pie chart, and 50% is genetic, 40% is up for grabs, this means that 90% of long-term happiness is based on how your brain processes the world. And I want you just to think about that. 90% of long-term happiness is based on how our brains are processing the world. All right, so let's talk about the conventional happiness formula that uh, has been around for decades and decades and decades. And it says this, that if you work hard, you will become successful. And once you become successful, you will then be happy. So we've kind of been under the um, idea that really our job is to go out and get a good job that hopefully makes us a lot of money, and we continue to climb the corporate ladder, so to speak. And as we climb that corporate ladder, we make more money, we buy more material things, we live in bigger houses, we drive better cars, and once we can accomplish those things, we will then be happy. Well, let me tell you what. What Sean Aker and Positive Psychology Research has discovered is that this formula is actually backwards. What we really know is that success is not the key to happiness that happiness is the key to success. If you love what you are doing, you will be successful. Here's what we know, that happiness does not lie on the other side of success. That actually when we can get your well-being in check, when we can get your happiness on first, that success actually lies after that. And so we've got to flip this formula. It is not about working harder first and becoming more successful, which then leads to happiness. It's about finding your happy now, even in the midst of what is going on. Being able to retrain your lens towards positive, and see all that is good in your life, even though it may not be perfect, all that is good in your life now, and that success follows happiness. 
So yes, I love this quote too. We become more successful when we are happier and more positive. But also let me tell you this, folks. It's not wishful thinking. And even with me giving you, giving you the research today, and I'm going to give you some happiness habits, that's not going to up your happiness level. What I have found is that happiness has to be a practice. It has to be action-oriented, something that you are actually doing and practicing in your life. So we have to take action. We can't just know the research. We can't just know what makes us happier. We have to make it become a habit and a practice. And yes, Peggy, the happiness research does describe what they mean by success. And success means many different things to people. Um, believe it or not, it's, it's not really tied to money. Uh, true success, I believe, and the happiness research talks about this, true success comes from having meaning and purpose in our lives to having that sense that we are on a mission, that we are contributing to the greater good, that we have a sense of fulfillment in our life, uh, the research comes back really that that's where you're going to get the most success in life, when you can tap in to that mission, that sense of fulfillment and meaning to our lives. So here's what else I like to discuss. Uh, that comes from Sean Aker, and this is why now we get phone calls not just to come into schools, but I recently had a hospital that, that called me and said, hey, we want you to come train our upper uh, level management team on happiness because we have seen the research from Sean Aker that says this, your brain at positive is 31% more productive than your brain at negative, neutral, or stressed. Let's think about that for a minute. Let's think about that. When your brain is stressed or your brain is negative or even when it's at neutral, you are not going to be as productive. But when we can shift, when we can shift your brain to positive, then you can plan to see a 31% increase in productivity levels. And you know, this really speaks to me when it comes to teachers because, yeah, See, the teachers need to know this because I believe that most of our brains have been at negative, neutral, and stressed. And I believe that we've kind of uh, sold our soul to our profession and that we're there every evening and we're there on the weekends and we're missing some important things in our own family's lives because we feel like we can't stay above the fray in this profession. There's so much to do and so much to be accomplished. And teachers are mostly type A, and they, wanna, they want everything organized, and they want to do everything, and they want to do it really, really well. But what they don't realize is that by just really giving all of themselves to this profession, that they're actually losing their productivity on top of their personal lives. And so I think we have to give that back. I think we have to reclaim our, our joy, both in our personal lives, and when we can reclaim our joy in our personal lives, then that's going to have a huge effect on our professional life. And so I'm kind of on a mission here to uh, retrain educators' brains and get them to positive and teach them how to do this. And uh, yeah, thanks for posting that, Paula. Uh, Sean Aker has this amazing TED Talk where he kind of breaks all of this down and he says, look, folks. Uh, this idea of there being no play and no laughter and no joy on the job and, and not taking our well-being uh, at the forefront. We've got to switch this. We've got to, start, we've got to start incorporating these things at the workplace. And when you do, you're going to see positive results. Um, so I appreciate you posting that over here in the chat box. Well, why is this an issue? Um, I think actually I just already hit upon that. It's an issue because we are struggling to find our so-called balance in this career, our balance as educators, um, and all kind of that is bestowed upon us. And um, we, we've really got to figure out how to show up and do the best job that we can 
but also to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. Um, and so really it comes down to this, you know, as teachers, we have to have the courage to believe that it is worth it to take a step back, that you do need to consider your own well-being, that incorporating some play and some fun and some self-care and some self-nurturing in our own lives um, is very important. And so, uh, yes, and I see here, Peggy, uh, do I have any links I could share about what I'm doing in classrooms to support social and emotional learning and a positive mindset? So it's interesting that you bring that up. Um, I'm a big proponent of the growth mindset curriculum. We, uh, I teach that uh, in a lot of schools. And, and one of the things that the growth mindset curriculum does kind of hit on is this happiness piece, is how do we kind of go into classrooms and teach our students to be uh, positive contributors to their classroom, to their communities? How do we teach students to value themselves enough to know that they are worth it, that they have a contribution to make, that what they have to say and do is of value? And so our growth mindset curriculum hits a lot on that social and emotional learning um, and that idea of how do we teach kids a curriculum of happiness? Now, I'm going to share a little secret with you. I really haven't even told anyone this yet. But I have started to create a training that hits on this whole philosophy of happy teachers plus happy schools equals happy students. And I think that we've got to get back in touch with kind of that social curriculum. You know, yes, I'm big about the standards. I'm a former, former curriculum director. I think that there's a certain set of skills that our students need to be able to master. But I think just as important is this whole social and emotional learning component. I think that's as important and maybe even more important than our standards. And so, um, you know, I have a consultant on my, tree, on my team, Jennifer Mitchell, and, and she's really dug into the whole trauma informed classroom piece, which also has a strong component for students and teachers on that whole social emotional learning environment, um, the well-being of our students and the well-being of our teachers. And so, yeah, here at Struggle Education, that, that's a topic that we're really uh, digging into and developing even more. All right, so here's what I have to say, folks. We've got to quit missing those magical moments. Uh, I'll be the first to admit that I, everything I do is fast. I talk fast. I move fast. Uh, I struggle to sit still. Um, I have a to-do list, it seems like, every single day that I'm trying to accomplish. And so I really have to work on that whole idea of not missing the magic of the moment, of really being present in my own life. Uh, and I've got some things that I do that, that really do help me uh, accomplish that. But I think that, you know, there are so many magical moments that are happening uh, on a daily basis. And so if we can take some time to breathe and to allow ourselves to really pay attention to these little bitty things in our lives that are actually really big things. So let's talk about the MED. Uh, I heard my good friend Matt Miller talking about this, and it's a topic that I talk about too, and it just continued to resonate with me because I have teachers say, I love what you're saying, uh, Kim Strobel. I just, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to take off my plate. I, I'm afraid to not do something or to leave my desk undone at the end of the day. Um, and so what we talk about is this idea of the minimum effective dosage. And so I like to kind of create the analogy like Matt does, uh, you know, boiling water. You boil water at 212 degrees. There's no need to boil it at 236 or 272. 
you know, the boiling point is 212. And so I think it's the same thing for teachers, and it kind of relates back to that productivity quote, you know, that you're more productive when your brain's at positive. And so what we have to really figure out is what is the minimum effective dosage? What is good enough? And again, boy, this is a hard one for teachers, you know, those type A, OCD, uh, perfectionistic in nature. Uh, you know, we, we're hard workers, and, and we want all of our ducks in a row, and I think it's an admirable trait, and, and we're workhorses, and we're trying to do right by kids. But I think that you also have to make a decision that takes some courage, that says, I am going to have to back off because my well-being in my personal life is important. You know, it makes me think back to a teacher that I was talking to last year, and she's a grandmother now, and she's still in the classroom. And she said, look, if there's one piece of advice I'd give to younger teachers, she said, I would tell them to leave the classroom by 4 p.m. and go home. She said personally she would do anything to get those hours back that she spent till 6 or 7 p.m. working in her classroom when her small children were at home. And so sometimes I think that we just need to be given permission. We need to be given permission to take our life back. Yes, we want to step in our classrooms. We want to do our best. But when we can get our well-being in check, our productivity levels will be higher. And when they're higher, then we're doing even better things in the classroom. So I ask teachers this. All that extra work you're doing, what is it costing you? I think back to another teacher, Jamie McMurray. She's a teacher at Washington Community Schools, and I have done about 20 days a year for the last few years with them. And she came up to me after a training, knowing I was a happiness coach. And she said, Kim, I have to share with you that this past year I decided I was not going to spend every evening in my classroom and every Saturday. She said, I decided I wasn't going to miss my first graders' soccer games on Saturday mornings anymore to be in my classroom. And she said, this year, my evaluation went from highly effective to effective. So I guess that means I'm going to have to go back to being in my classroom on Saturdays and staying in the evenings. And I said to Jamie, don't you dare. I know that we all want to be highly effective. It's important that we show up with our best every day. But when you're missing your child's soccer games, when you're taking time away from your family, I'm here to tell you it is not worth it. Because you have to ask yourself, what is it costing you? And maybe, maybe sometimes we need to be okay with effective if it means our well-being is in check. So again, I just kind of challenge our teachers to figure out if maybe you can't go back to what's the minimum effective dosage. All right. So let's get to uh, some of that 40%. What can we do to increase our happiness levels? And uh, what does that look like? All right. Well, here's what we know. Happiness is a choice. It's a choice. At least 40% of it is. The research has shown we can rewire our brains. We can make ourselves happy or happier by practicing simple exercises every day for three weeks. All right. And so, before I get to these exercises, I'm going to get to a couple of other slides that I want to talk about. But when we start talking about what are these happiness habits, how do I increase that baseline? 
um, what we know is that after 21 days, those habits will actually change the neural pathways of your brain. And that it will turn you in to lifelong happiness seekers. All right. So I love this little graphic. Where did you find that? I've been searching everywhere for it. And the other little character says, I created it myself. I love this for many reasons because I do think that all of us look for happiness outside of ourselves. Um, I, I do it too. My husband thinks that I'm finding happiness in the number of shoes that he continues to see pile up in, our, in my closet. Uh, it's easy to want to go out and think that certain things will increase our happiness level. And it's not bad. It's not bad to love clothes or to love shoes or to love beautiful things. But what we know is that you can't count on those things because happiness is really an inside job. And so it's really our responsibility. It's, it's no one else's responsibility. It's up to us. And we have to own that. We have to take 100% responsibility for our lives. No matter what challenges we've endured, uh, it's up to us. And so I actually think that that's powerful, knowing that we are responsible, that we have the power to take our happiness back. All right. So number one, know your value. You see, I believe that if you can't see your value, then the world can't give you value back. And we need to talk about that because really what this is about is this, a, this is about giving to yourself. And this seems to be a really difficult thing for people to do, to give to themselves. Um, I actually find that women struggle even more with this than men. So what do I mean by giving to yourself? Well, it starts with these small little things. You know, you have to show the world that you value yourself. What does this mean for me? This means that five out of seven days a week, I'm going to exercise. I'm going to exercise because I value myself enough to know that I deserve an hour away from the family at least five days a week. What this means is, for me, I'm going to get a massage every two weeks. Yes, I'm going to spend that money on myself every two weeks because I believe that I'm worth it. And this might mean that you're going to give yourself time to read a book, that you're going to give yourself uh, permission to miss something going on with your kids because you value yourself enough to give to yourself at times. Um, when I think about this, you know, I think about my mom's generation. This was especially hard because you were told that you are to put everyone else first. You know, you take care of your husband, you take care of your children, you put a meal on the table, and you take care of everyone else first. And once everyone else is taken care of, then maybe you can take care of yourself. But what that led to was really a generation of women who were kind of resentful because they never knew how to love themselves enough. And so I think that it even starts with these really small things like, you know when someone offers to pay for your meal, what do we do? We kind of poo poo and say, no, 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 I, I can get my own. Thank you, but I'll get my own. Or when someone gives us a gift or someone opens the door for us, we will even let people do those small little gestures for us. And when you do that, what you're telling the world is that you don't value yourself enough to receive the gift that someone's wanting to give you. And so we need to start valuing ourselves. We need to start saying, you know what? I am worth it. I am worth this time. I am worth giving myself permission to do this. Because here's what I know, that when my cup is not just full, but when Kim Strobel's self-love cup is overflowing, when I build that baby up, then I have so much more 
to give others in my life. I'm a better mom. I'm a better wife. I'm a better friend. And I'm a better daughter. But when I defeat myself, you're not going to get the best of me. And so, you know, this kind of always reminds me of a conversation I had recently with a young mother. She came up to me and she said, I don't know why I'm telling you this and I'm embarrassed and ashamed to admit it, but I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old, and I spend my life picking up toys and changing diapers and preparing meals and going to work and doing the Walmart shopping. And she said, I know I should have every reason in the world uh, to be thankful, and I should be happy with my life. But she said, I'm not, Kim. I've lost myself. And I said, Madeline, here's what you need to know. You have to take time for yourself. Your kids need to know that mommy loves herself enough to sometimes take care of her. And when your kids grow up and they go out into the world as an adult and the stresses and the responsibilities pile up on them, you want them to know that who they are matters enough and that they should value themselves enough to take care of them. And so I think this is really important for educators. And I ask you, what are you doing for yourself? Because it's not selfish. It's not selfish to take care of you some of the time. You have to come first some of the time. And that's going to feel uncomfortable. But it's important. It's important for your family and your children to see you doing that. And most importantly, it's important for you. So taking good care of you means the people in your life will receive the best of you rather than what's left of you. Oh, my goodness, folks. I could talk this topic all day long. I'm already looking, and I see that I, I have about eight minutes left. So I'm going to keep going here. Um, this is an interesting quote, as I began to love myself, I freed myself of anything that is no good for my health, food, people, things, situations, and everything that drew me down and away from myself. At first, I called this attitude a healthy egoism. Today, I know it is love of oneself. And that came from Charlie Chaplin on his 70th birthday. So again, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. It's just like they tell you on the airplane. Don't you dare turn to that little kid next to you and put the oxygen mask on them first. You put it on yourself. Then you'll be able to take care of everyone else. Yeah, such a powerful quote. Uh, all right. Oh, good, Trish. I'm so glad you like that. Yes, the airplane analogy is spot on. All right, so let's get to number two, play and laughter. Play and laughter. Well, let me tell you, as I've done the happiness research, I was reading where Lee Iacocca, who was the big uh, CEO, I believe, of the Chrysler Corporation back in the day, actually had laughter as a disciplinary assist. If he came across you working on the assembly line and you were laughing, it was a disciplinary assist. Well, let me tell you what, folks. Our landscape is changing. We know that play and laughter is as important to our students and our children as it is to us adults, that we too need opportunities to play in our own life. And play might look different to all of you. Play might be reading a book. Play may be, uh, for me, it's chasing my four dogs around the house in a game of hide and seek, you know. Um, but I think that play is important. And Stuart Brown, he wrote a book called Play, how it shapes the brain, opens the imagination, and invigorates the soul. And let me tell you what, play is missing from our classrooms. Uh, we haven't always felt like we've had permission to play in the classroom. I remember when they took extra recesses away and they said, no, we don't have time for all those recesses. Our kids need to be learning how to read and write and do mathematics. And I remember when they came into the kindergarten classrooms of my school and they took out the stoves and the ovens and they said, oh no, we don't have time for our kids to cook, you know. Well, let me tell you what, folks, that was a mistake. 
That was a mistake because play and laughter are critical, both to the classroom and to um, our own lives. And so I want to share a couple of ideas with you. I have some administrators that have heard me talk about this, and so they've incorporated what they call joy clubs or fun Fridays. And so uh, Ashley Brugenschmidt, who's one of my administrators at Sharon Elementary in Newburgh, Indiana, her teachers have what they call fun Fridays. And um, every other Friday, instead of doing a morning uh, faculty meeting, they have a fun Friday, and they incorporate play and games with their teachers. And she was just saying that their teachers love it. They love stepping away from the so-called business of everything and just having fun with one another, uh, developing and nurturing those relationships. And so uh, I think that that is so important that we've got to get play back into the classroom. And Dr. Spencer Kagan has a great book here, Silly Sports and Goofy Games. So if you're looking for some games to incorporate both uh, with your students and adults, you might check that one out. Okay. Oh my goodness. I think we're going to get through this one here and then we're probably going to be close to uh, having to call it quits even though I could keep going. So let's talk about retraining our brain because the fact is that many of us do have a negative brain, uh, that our thoughts just shift towards negative so much of the time. And so I want to tell you this, um, thoughts in a day, all right, here's the deal, here's the research. On average, human beings have 50 to 70,000 thoughts in a day, and the research says, that for most of us, 80% of those thoughts are negative. 80% of our thoughts are negative. If I take you back to even the first 30 seconds of today, or let me take you back to the 30 seconds of, of a typical Monday morning when that alarm clock goes off. Some of you have had 72 negative thoughts within the first 30 seconds of your feet hitting the floor, right? Oh, I didn't get enough sleep last night. Oh, I've got to go to work today. Oh, it's too early. Oh, my pants are too tight, you know? I mean, it just starts. And so what's interesting is if 80% of those thoughts are negative, what the research says is that 95% of those 80% are the exact same thoughts you had the day before. Oh, so we've got to work on this. We've got to retrain the brain towards positive. And, and this is a practice. This is a practice. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And I see, Peggy, there that, that you discovered that, yeah, I've seen that from um, the life's good. And so uh, that idea of a virtual field trip uh, to explore the science of happiness. Oh, I love that. All right. So. I want to end here, and I know we've got three minutes for me to talk, but one of the most powerful happiness habits that I have found and that science backs up is the power of gratitude. So if you want to retrain your brain, if you want to retrain it towards positive, if you want to increase your baseline happiness level, then you need to consider a practice of gratitude. So this is actually my current gratitude journal. Let me tell you how I currently use this. So every, every evening, um, I incorporate meditation, which is also one of the top five happiness habits. And you know, I think mindfulness in the classroom is also super important. So I, I have a little meditation practice that I do. I, I happen to use the Ananda app from Deepak Chopra. And after I do that, I open this gratitude journal, and I write 10 things that I'm thankful for. And I think I even did a screenshot here. This was mine from back in April. You know, I was thankful for, for cool breezes and good books to read on my deck. I was thankful for my husband and son's laughter in the car. I was thankful for our weekly pizza date with family. Uh, I was thankful that day for my brothers who are just uh, outstanding fathers and husbands. And so every day, I write down 10 things that I'm thankful for. And I started this practice after hearing Oprah talk about it years ago. She's big on gratitude journals. 
And I'll tell you what this has done for me, is it makes me go throughout my day constantly seeing all the good that surrounds me. And it's really reset my brain to scan my environment for the things that are good, for the abundance that is around me, for the gifts that are truly bestowed on me um, on a daily basis. And, and yeah, I mean, boy, you should check out Tara Martin's Gratitude Snaps Challenge uh, that was just posted here in the chat room that's in our live binder as well. Uh, it, that's a great way to consider doing gratitude and gratitude with our students. And so, you know, we had a gratitude practice in the classroom. We would take about 90 seconds each day uh, if the kids would go around and they would tell us one thing they were grateful for. And let me tell you, that retrained all of my students' brains to consider what's going well in their life and to start every day with uh, gratitude and thankfulness. All right, so I see that it's 12 o'clock. It's time for me to stop talking. I'm going to kind of uh, go down here to this very last slide. And I want to encourage you to make happiness a habit in your life, folks. Make it a practice. Uh, take action. And you, you will see the results. Thanks so much, Kim. I was able to capture a couple of questions, and there were others that you answered during your presentation. The first one I captured, do you have tips for how teachers can make personal decisions about what they can take off their plates without feeling they are risking their jobs? Yes, that's a question that I get a lot. I'm going to go ahead and um, apologize. The, the noon siren is ringing in Tell City, Indiana, mm -hmm. and, and my four dogs are howling in the background. So if you hear any howling, it's the four Strobel dogs that are singing to the tune of the siren. Okay. Um, so this is an important question, and one that um, I think there's a variety of answers to. One of the things that, that I'm a proponent of is standards-based grading because it includes this component of prioritizing standards. You know, one of the issues is that we're responsible for too much. You know, we might have 36 language arts standards and 27 math standards or, you know, 30 some science standards. And what we know is that if we're going to do a good job teaching those things, that we can't teach all of them to the same level. And so one of the things that we do is we walk teachers through this idea of prioritizing standards, of saying, look, do you want your students to leave with surface level knowledge? Or do you want them to leave with some deep knowledge and put some of this information into their long-term memory where it sticks with them for a lifetime? And so we kind of look through the standards. And uh, it's a process that we use where we say, OK, let's, let's pick 10 to 15 per subject area that are going to get 50 to 75% of our instruction time. Those are going to be our power standards. Those are going to be the ones that we spend the most time on. And then which ones are going to be kind of our tier two standards that are going to get 25 to 50 percent of our instruction time? And then which ones are the let it go standards, the, the ones that get less than 5 percent? And I found that administrators are on board with this, that they agree that, hey, I don't want my students leaving here with this surface level knowledge that that the job that's bestowed upon us is so great, so we've got to learn to prioritize. So that might be, you know, something that you consider approaching your administration about, because you're right. Uh, it feels like we just pile one thing on top of the other, and we, we don't let go of anything. And um, so there's actually a lot of things that we need to reprioritize in the classroom, and sometimes it takes some coaching from outside consultants or some conversations uh, with your leadership teams. But um, that might be something for you to consider. Thanks, Kim. Why is it so easy for us to be self-critical? Is it because it has become a habit? Well, uh, I think it is definitely a habit. 
and I think it's just the nature of the human mind. Um, it's almost as if, you know, I were to draw a circle and if I were to put, you know, uh, 99 good dots in that circle and, and one black dark dot, we would all focus on the one black dark dot. I, I think it's part of who we are. I know myself, I've had to work on that. I can go give a training and I don't know, there might be a thousand teachers in there and I'll leave with, you know, 975 stellar evaluations and maybe 20 or 25 that are less than stellar and boy, that's the only ones I'll focus on. And mm -hmm. I'll give you that, a tip of someone that, that has helped me a lot and that's Brene Brown. Uh, she has written two or three books that are just some of my favorites. I'm looking at them on my bookshelf right now. And one of hers is called The Gifts of Imperfection. The Gifts of Imperfection. And the other is Daring Greatly. And so those are two resources that have really helped me uh, let go of this idea of perfectionism and uh, having to please everyone else. And I actually have found that once I learn to kind of embrace my own imperfection, that maybe it won't be perfect, but it needs to be good enough at times. Uh, that really freed me up. So, Again, thanks so much, Kim. Those were the two questions that you hadn't responded to during the session, and I don't see any others at this point. So I'll let you talk about the Strobel Summit coming up, and then we'll wrap up. OK, yeah. So. Um, on my website, actually, strobeleducation.com, um, you're going to see a couple of things on there. There should be um, a pop-up box that says you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, and in my newsletter, what we do is we do talk about some of the important topics in education. Uh, we let people know, you know when we're going to be teaching certain topics uh, all across the, the country. A lot of of our topics uh, that we teach are going to be in Indiana, in Ohio, and Kentucky. Uh, and then we get called to do on-site visits throughout the country. Um, but one of the other things that's kind of important about our newsletter is I send something every other week called a joy drop. And it's really not even related to education. It's uh, I wanted something for teachers to just sit down on a Thursday morning and get a little 30 second uh, email in their inbox that might be a, a happiness tip that I've shared or a little inspirational story. So that's one thing that you're going to find on the website. You'll even see a little box that says, uh, you know, click here to receive our joy drops. But the slide you're looking at is actually the Strobel Summit, which is taking place. So if any of you uh, joined Matt Miller's Ditch Summit back in Christmas, this is our version of it in the summertime. And so this is free online PD. Uh, you can sit in a pair of PJs with a glass of wine in your hands and take this PD if you want. Uh, we're going to release it July 11th. And what I've done is I've interviewed six pioneer educators. They're going to talk about different topics. And uh, each of them is about an hour long. It's completely free to educators. And you, uh, once you watch it, you can download your professional growth point certificate so you can earn up to six hours. Uh, we're going to release one per day starting July 11th for six days in a row. And we're going to leave it open for three weeks. So if you're on vacation that week, no worries. You can hit the six free sessions the next week. But uh, this is just our kind of idea for giving away some free PD and letting our teachers know that we really do value them. Um, and then giving them these tips, uh, you know, kind of, opening their eyes to the idea of growth mindset or genius hour or some of these kind of hot topics. Uh, we've got Hal Bowman doing a session. He's the teach like a rock star guy down in Texas and he's going to talk about the importance of relationships. And Matt Miller is going to talk about, talk about ditching that homework and several others. So if you're interested, on our website you can see there's a little link there or you can find it here in our notes where you can register uh, for the, the summit if you're interested in some, some free PD this summer. 
And, and yeah, the videos will just be available for three weeks and then they'll be taken down. So but you will have three weeks to watch. So we hope that you join us for that. Oh, great, Paula. I'm glad you, you registered. Yeah, we actually, I think we have uh, about 4,000 people from around the world who have registered to uh, take this. So we're, we're happy to offer it. Again, thanks so much, Kim. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Kim. What an inspiring way to start our day and actually to change our thinking about next year and how things can be different. We are so inspired. Thanks so much for sharing with us. And I am so happy we have this recording so that people that couldn't join us this morning will get to hear you whenever they can, can tune in. So thanks a lot. Everyone, we just have one more webinar before our summer break. And we need and want every one of you to join us for our open mic show next Saturday. It's become a tradition for us, and it is so much fun to have everyone come get on the mic Talk about your summer bucket list. We've got lots of categories to talk about. So there's bound to be something you'll have something to share, whether it's travel, whether it's reading new books, whether it's um, <clears throat> spending time at the beach, anything that you could share with us. And we're going to provide some incentives. We have some great prizes for people who come and take the mic. So. Start thinking about what you'd like to share. There's a sign-up sheet on our website, and we'll be tweeting it out again. And uh, plan to come. Get on the mic. Share it with your friends. Invite them to come and get on the, web, on the webinar and take the mic, because they have a great chance of winning some awesome prizes. And then we'll take our break from really through from ISTE through the end of July, and then we'll return on August 4th. So thank you all for joining us today, and come back next Saturday. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar where you can sign up for a Collaborate session. And as long as it's open to the public, it is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link or from within the Live Binder. You can nominate yourself as a featured teacher of the month. The video collection is on iTunes you as well as YouTube for recordings of the uh, presentations of the webinars. When you exit the session and complete the survey, which is on the next slide, you can request a professional develop development certificate. It now prints out with your name. And you get these thanks to Patty Ruffing. When you exit the session, this survey link should appear. If it doesn't, you can take the link from the chat or from within the live binder. Again, special thanks to Kim Strobel, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>